Okay, I'd like to welcome Director of Outpost and Outpost 2, Black Sun, Steve Barker. Hey, how you doing? Good. So, um, Steve, were you surprised at just how well audiences embraced and supported the first Outpost movie? I, I was amazed, to be honest. Um, I mean, the, the first one came out of uh, I mean, making British independent films is tough enough as it stands. Yeah. And Kieran Parker, one of the producers, and I had been developing a different film. Um, and like so many people, you kind of go, you have the, the low budget horror movie in your back pocket that you yeah. think about. And he actually just came to me and was like, How do you feel about doing a movie that's like kind of just modern day soldiers yeah. fighting undead Nazis? I was like, I'll do it. <laughs> and I just sort of saw it as a chance to do this kind of love letter to everything I'd, I'd grown up loving. Yeah. I was part of that first video generation watching the early John Carpenter and Alien and yeah. the like. And so we, we did it for such a small amount of money up mm -hmm. in Scotland, well away from what you would call the hub of the British film industry. Yeah. So the concept that anyone other than my mother was going to see it was kind of amazing. Yeah. And so when, yeah, when it, I, I still remember kind of going to the movies the day it opened, the first mm -hmm. one opened, and just quite, not quite believing that people were buying tickets and going to see a film. <laughs> I kept on going to them and going, you do realise that I made this, you don't want to do that. <laughs> so yeah, it, it, was, it was astonishing. Really. Yeah. Um, and did you always have an idea for a sequel if the first one was successful, or did that come much oh later? God, no, I, to be honest, I think we'd have done ourselves a favour and not killed everyone in the first film if we ever knew right. there was going to be another one. Yeah. Like trying to put a narrative together for the second was a nightmare. Mm -hmm. To the point where I mean, so much so that when the first one did okay and they, yeah. they wanted to do another one, I ended up having to sit and watch the first one just to try and find a hook that mm -hmm. could get us back in. Um, and the principal villain in this is based on a guy who literally was a background extra who right. on a day we put a lab coat on yeah. and went, oh, you're the dude that invented the machine. Yeah. And managed to build it, had to build a whole movie out yeah. of it. Well, I think that works quite well in, in, in the fact that, yes, there's a, there's a few links there, yeah. but it's not just a retread of the first film. You're kind of bringing it into our world and, uh, you know. No, absolutely. I mean, I think that was the, the plan. I, mean, I thought if we were going to do... I've never even considered the possibility of making something which would be considered worthy yeah. of a sequel anyway. But then when I did stop to think about it, it's hard enough to get people to make, make one film. And you don't, I just didn't want that feeling that you go and make two movies and at the end of it you go, I made two movies and they were both exactly the same. Yeah. <laughs> so even though you risk potentially alienating your audience the first time, mm. the sequels I've always liked to try to do something different. And yeah. I thought it was a risk worth taking. It was like, well, let's just shift genres and, yeah. and try for something that's a bit more action adventure -y and, yeah. and it's still got sort of spooks and a bit of tension in it, yeah. but it's, it's a bit more of a kind of pacey fun. Yeah. Sort of ride movie, yeah. as opposed to the first one being kind of very much a sort of siege. Yeah, and I like the, the special forces unit. I mean, you really play <laughs> on the sort of genre stereotypes. With that. Yeah, I mean at that. I mean, genre films by their nature they have generic yeah. elements, and yeah. so it's knowing. Hopefully, I guess that to get the key to getting it right is knowing which ones to keep, which ones to change. And yeah. because we'd we were changing so much tonally about the first film. And you know we had a female lead, and, yeah. and I, I put in all these elements that try that kind of forced me to try and make a different movie. Um, when it came to the soldiers, I mean, you do a film like this, you're going to have to have men with guns in it, right? Yeah. And and so it seemed like fun if you were going to keep that. If you're going to be if you're going to be uncharitable, you say they're stereotypes. If you're going to be charitable, you say they're archetypes. Yeah. And it seemed like a lot of fun to sort of just keep them within that and yeah. just have, yeah. a, have a have a laugh with them. Yeah. Mm. And, and we were really lucky with the cast as well. They were all great yeah. guys. I was going to say as well, um, the two leads, you've got Catherine Steadman as mm -hmm. Lena, and then for Wallace, Richard Coyle, yeah. who's just everywhere at the moment. He's I know. Movies, he's done Pusher. You must have been delighted to get him. I was made up because um, we, we, for Lena we auditioned, and we, mm. we saw a lot of people for Lena, although Catherine actually came on the first morning and just smashed it. I thought she was brilliant. Mm. Um, and she was exactly, so many, so many people had come in and read for that role, and they hadn't played the character, they played the kind of person you would ima they imagined you right. would see in this kind of movie, whereas yeah. Catherine actually just played the character. Mm. Um, with Richard, I kind of suggested him, because right. he was probably best known for, um, for comedy, really, to mm. a certain degree. But I, you know, I knew from little bits of scene that he was a sensational actor, I just loved him, and I needed someone yeah. who was potentially very likeable, but at the same time, you get that edge that he's a bit shifty. Yeah. And I thought Richard naturally had that. And we were just really lucky. We sent him the script. Uh, he really liked the first film. And he was actually shooting gap Grabbers at the okay. time. Yeah. And so we couldn't meet. And we ended up just getting on the phone. We were on the phone for a good like two hours. And kind of by the end of it, put the phone down and sort of realised, 
I think he said yeah, but I don't, we, we actually kind of went past the bit where he was going to say yeah and just yeah. started talking about how we were going to do it. Like, he was a fabulous guy, he's amazingly, amazingly prepared. Mm. So I mean, I actually only met him for the first time two days before we started oh, shooting. Right. We'd spoken on the phone a lot, but we went out for a few drinks. He had these amazing notes, enormous amounts of notes, so much mm. so that it made me feel ashamed that I didn't have notes that were anywhere near as good about their character I'd co-written. <laughs> and he just thought it all through completely. Yeah. He's incredibly prepared. And the same with Catherine, he's amazingly dedicated. Mm. Um, to the point where I think, because he, she was surrounded by a bunch of like enormous guys dressed as soldiers and they're all around, they've got their toys, they've got yeah. their guns, they're loving all that. A lot of the time, I think she, you could tell, because she, she'd not done a role like this before, yeah. she was really trying to prove herself to the point where we were kind of, no really, you don't have to throw yourself at a wall quite like that, look, because yeah. you're going to hurt yourself and then I'm in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're immensely dedicated. And th those two, I, I think, it was, we were very lucky that we shot for a week with just them before the right, soldiers okay. came, just, just naturally the way the schedule came yeah. together. So they'd actually kind of really got to know one another well. Yeah. And then these kind of rambunctious lot of lunatics showed up and <laughs> started running about with their guns and shouting a lot. Yeah. So the film's set in Eastern Europe, but yeah. filmed again in Scotland? Yeah, the whole yeah. thing was done in Scotland. Both yeah. movies have been done entirely in Scotland. Yeah. So. And was it a real kind of problem having to go back and recreate the bunker from the first film like all over again? I, I thought it was going to be because um, we needed more space this time because of, I mean, I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but there are other elements than there were in the first film. Yeah. And um, uh, so we needed more space, and which meant we couldn't build in the same place we'd done previously. Yeah. Um, but the production designer and the production design team, James Lapsley and his team, I think did an, an astounding job on, on pennies. I mean, this film's cost a fraction more than the first one. The first one cost nothing. Yeah. This one's cost nothing and a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I think... If there's one thing I'm proud of, I don't think you can tell. I think it looks like quite a large yeah. scale flick, and a lot of that's down to Darren Tin's fabulous photography and um, uh, and Lapsley's work in yeah. designing and building the sets. And and then with the, I mean, the, one of the great things about Scotland is you've just got this amazing countryside, just yeah. wonderful vistas and things. But we shot all the exteriors for both films in Dumfries and Galloway. Mm -hmm. um, and in this one, we went to. Um, and an MOD test firing range, and they were amazingly welcoming, which is where a lot of things like ruined tanks and things came from, and they yeah. let me set up really nasty black smoke everywhere. And <laughs> that's where they're incredibly, incredibly helpful. Yeah. So much as well, we had, um, for a lot of the Nats, for the, a lot of the larger scale scenes where you've got um, NATO soldiers and Nazis, they're yeah. all um, TA guys that have been back for okay. like six months from Afghanistan. I remember we, we prepped with them for, I, I was actually shooting other stuff, but the first was prepping one of the battles with them for two days, and they'd kind of walk around doing their bits and you know, holding yeah. sticks and going bang, bang, bang. <laughs> and we went to one live rehearsal before we went for a take, and the whole idea, they'd all been prepped, like when you throw a punch, you can't be anywhere yeah. near from here to here. And these were all guys, literally had been back out from Afghanistan six months, we call the action, they're just like just kicking lumps out of one <laughs> another, <laughs> throwing cameras around, trying to catch as much of it as we could. Mm. Um, yeah, so we, I mean, Scotland's a brilliant place to make movies. You can, you've got, it's got incredible crews, and you can, you can find the most astonishing locations, and they're not yeah. overshot. They're not the kind of, you know, it's not the same forest yeah, that you're constantly so showing up the moment anyone from London tries to go, to go out to the nearest forest they can find to use or whatever. Yeah. Obviously, you can't have a, an outpost movie without Nazi zombies. Yeah. You were really lucky to have uh, Paul Hyatt do Absolutely. For you. We're amazingly lucky. He's an astonishing guy. Yeah. Amazing guy. Um, I actually, because it, it took a while for this one to kind of come around, because obviously we were putting it together right after an economic meltdown and right in the middle of a recession that followed, yeah. and it's an independent movie. So I think I initially spoke to Paul probably a year before. Right. Um, and we just bonded really quickly over a mutual love of this kind of movie. Yeah. And so it became amazingly easy to work with him. But even I couldn't believe how good the stuff was when it showed up. Actually, I mean, it was it was astonishing. To the point where I'd already made the decision that I was going to light it like the first film. Yeah. It was going to be very dark and you were going to see very, very little of it. Yeah. Because I love that kind of light and shadow rather than right up front. And, um, and it seemed like such a shame that the work yeah. was so good. Um, you do find yourself like kind of going, Paul's going to kill me. They've got so much work in this, you can barely see anything. There's yeah. just like little eight, eight edges of highlights and things. But yeah, so I mean, he was a, he was a dream to work with, and his team as well. Yeah. Like, Paul, obviously, because he's brilliant, is amazingly stretched. He's, he's asked to do pretty much every movie. Yeah. And so when it came to the shoot, I think he was already committed to another job. And so once he'd finished the design and the construction of the Nazis, he passed that over to Christopher. 
Chris Fitzpatrick and his team. Right. Um, there's like uh, Ellie and Stephanie, and they were just astonishing for that. They were up with us for the whole shoot, and they were amazing, mm. absolutely incredible. I, I can't, I, I actually can't say yeah. enough about them. It used to blow me away. I'd be so made up, constantly getting photos, like send back to me more. <laughs> like, mum, this is me. Why am I not? <laughs> um, Right. Now I, I believe there's, there's talk there's going to be a third film now. They've, they've made a third oh, really? film. Oh really? Yeah. Um, I mean, I was I, I I can't tell you too much about it because I'm yeah. not really involved in it. It right. was it came together. I think there was there was a there was a feeling from when people were seeing kind of rushes the second one that yeah. they think they wanted to do a, a third one, and we had you know we still had a lot of the sets and the stages, yeah. and so. And almost in a kind of Roger Corman way, I think they were thinking, oh, there's a really good chance here to, yeah. to use this okay. and make something that was efficient and not got th go through the kind of pain we went through getting the money yeah. to have the okay. same one. But it meant that it, it all happened while... And I think, to be honest, I was kind of a bit zombied out by that. Yeah. I'd done two movies. I was starting to run out of ideas on how to kill people or how to shoot another corridor and make right. it look cool. Um, so, uh, but Ray, who co-wrote who wrote the first one, co-wrote yeah. the same one with me, um, set about the script while I was still... So I was still in post on the second right. film. Okay. And then... Once we'd finished, I was off writing another script and they shot earlier this year. I think they're in post at the moment. And okay. the great thing about it is that um, I'm finally going to get to see one of these as a punter. Yeah. I'm actually going to sit down and not spend the entire time agonising and sweating over cuts and moments and just going, you could have done that better, you should have done that better. That's complete mess. I'll actually just be able to watch it as, a, as an audience member. I'm quite excited about it. And the, the third one's been directed by the producer, Kieran. Oh, this is, this is kind of directing yeah. debut, so... Yeah, so it's still kind of kept in hands. Yeah, and, and because I've been away making the other movie, um, or finishing the second film and then doing this other thing, um, I've kind of, uh, I've, I'm totally spoiler free. I can't even tell yeah. you what it's about. Even if I wanted to tell you a story, I couldn't. Right. I've managed to kind of keep well away from it. It's been kind of hard over the last few days because the first time in a little while that Kieran, Ray and I all went together. Yeah. So it's been hard not to kind of get everything spoiled. But. Okay. So can you say anything about the other project you're working on at the moment? I'm actually working on two. I've just finished a script now for um, that I, I started um, about four months ago. That's a kind of... And it's a genre film again, but it's... I mean, I think I just love genre films. I think yeah. I'm always going to want to do <laughs> genre films. But not necessarily horror as such. Yeah. Like, I, I, I grew up watching science fiction and thrillers and yeah. whatever. Um, and this is, a, again... Um, kind of colliding genres I suppose it's a, it's a kind of it's, it's a neo-noir it's quite a quite dark neo-noir but it, it's got a lot of um, uh, elements of things like John Borman's Point Blank in it and revenge flicks from the 70s um, and and a taste of vampires as well okay. so it's, it's a sort of neo-noir vampire movie yeah <laughs> um, and it's called Blood Makes Noise okay. so I handed the script in for that two weeks ago hopefully people with money like it as much as I do and we'll be shooting that soon and I start writing on another job uh, which is a, a kind of Manhunter-esque film, but with a lot of elements mm -hmm. of uh, um, kind of puzzle box flicks, like uh, early Chris Nolan, like Memento or The Prestige, okay. yeah, a lot yeah. of that going to it. That, that was the first time I've ever started working on a project that wasn't, I didn't instigate it. Right. Someone pitched yeah. me the idea, and I just thought it was fabulous. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of, um, we just sort of sorted that out. It's two thirds of it set in Berlin. I got back from Berlin a week ago doing research, and I start writing. I've got that description by Christmas. Excellent. So this is great. I get to talk to you, <laughs> and then I get to go home, lock a door, and not come out for about four months, basically while I write it. Okay. Well, best of luck with that. Outpost Two, not Black Sun. It's out twenty seventh of August. I believe so. Yeah. DVD and Blu Ray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So go and see it. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. No, no. Thank, thank you. you so much as well. And thanks for all your hospitality while we've been down. Thank you. Cheers. Man.